And so we invited him to do it this month. And uh, turn it over to you, Gary. Okay, thank you. I want to thank you for the uh, invitation to be here. I uh, just wanted to uh, find out how many of you have an oscilloscope at home? Okay, quite a number of you. How many use them on a regular basis? Yeah, a, few, a few more there are uh, still doing that. Uh, my uh, background, uh, I thought I'd give you a little, uh, little background first of, uh, maybe I will, here we go, I'll do it this way. Uh, kind of my uh, work background and how I came into uh, contact or connection with uh, oscilloscopes. And I started out uh, back in uh, about 1957 working for uh, Northwest Airlines and uh, worked as a radio mechanic there. I did have a, uh, a commercial license which I got in high school along with my uh, uh, ham license which I got in uh, 1951. And, uh, been enjoying the ham radio aspect of that. Along with uh, the uh, work at uh, Northwest Airlines, got into uh, repairing and uh, doing some calibration on uh, flight simulators when they were flying DC-6s and 9s, and I think they even had a DC-3 in the fleet yet. And uh, we, uh, uh, in those days, this was in uh, days when the uh, flight simulators were all uh, analog computers. So we had a room about half this size full of uh, servo systems in uh, racks, and uh, we would uh, uh, service those. Then I went to uh, Honeywell. I was there for uh, about six years as a quality instrumentation technician, and uh, one of the uh, uh, places where I really learned oscilloscopes in the tube days was working on the old Tektronix 535s and 545s, uh, 465s. A little bit later, they were kind of the newer ones, and uh, they also kept you nice and warm in the in the uh, lab there at the same time. I uh, worked also as a uh, quality engineer for about a year on Mark 46 torpedo program. Uh, from there I decided to try my wings out in sales, so I went to the Kenneth W. Myers company, a manufacturer's rep firm, and I uh, was with them for seven years selling test equipment in the Twin Cities areas, calling on most of the companies uh, around the uh, Twin Cities. Uh, from there, I went to uh, Phillips Test and Measuring Instruments. I wanted to get back in the servicing area again, so I became a one-man service center in the uh, Twin Cities here, wore all the hats in the service center, and uh, calibrated and uh, repaired all of the Phillips uh, equipment for people in the area. And it was during this time I kind of kept uh, tabs on uh, some of the instrumentation, how many pieces of equipment uh, went through my one-man lab there, and. Uh, uh, typically, f during that 11-year uh, period, I uh, either calibrated or repaired and or uh, for uh, about anywhere from 200 to 400 oscilloscopes per year. And so we saw on the uh, reflector there probably calibrated thousands. Uh, that's a true statement, probably up in the two or 3,000. And then uh, Phillips went into a joint venture with the John Fluke Company and uh, put me out on the street, so I... Uh, was in a survival mode, and uh, they closed up the Phillips Service Center and uh, had a lot of disgruntled customers around the Twin Cities area, so I capitalized that and opened up my own calibration service center for Phillips uh, independently as Meyer Electronics. Uh, fortunately, my boss was very generous and a little upset they were closing the center. He was actually in New Jersey, so he gave me all the calibration equipment and uh, wrote it off. And so I had a setup to start doing some calibration work there. So we uh, continued on with that for about uh, three years. Uh, had a nice commute from the upstairs to the downstairs uh, and uh, worked uh, my own business. I uh, got on the advisory board for uh, Ridgewater College in Hutchinson, Minnesota. It was known as Hutchinson Technical College at that particular time. And uh, they had a metrology program. And so I was hired to teach uh, metrology there. I spent uh, 13 years commuting between Minnetonka and uh, Hutchinson and uh, 100 miles a day. So after about 13 years, I'm retiring. So I retired from there in 2001 and uh, opened up my own uh, consulting uh, business, j and Technology, which uh, I've been providing uh, training in industry, basically, and seminars for companies uh, in the uh, basically Twin Cities area. However, we have done some international, or not international, but national uh, training uh, for the uh, American Society for Quality. I've uh, uh, taught there a certified calibration technician uh, preparation course. I have that.
that cert as well as the Certified Quality Engineer from ASQ. So uh, just uh, this year I've made a decision I'm giving up the classroom stuff, but I'm going to keep my fingers a little in the uh, uh, training area and uh, putting these courses I have been teaching uh, on the internet. So uh, the company J&G Technology, J is my wife Joyce, and so uh, basically it's just the, uh, uh, the two of us there. So that's a little bit of my background. Who recognizes this one? How many have had one of those? Okay, got about three or four. Who makes it? Or who made it? Did you build it as a kid? It came as a kid, actually. GTI, was it? Ico. E I C O. Ico. And uh, five megahertz or so. No, yeah. it was kilohertz, wasn't it? It was in the kilohertz, yeah. I believe. And the spec was pretty low. Like a cycle. And uh, <laughs> so we, uh, from there, my little moist mouse pointer going here. Anybody know what model number that is? <coughs> here we go. Maybe we will. Must be a little static electricity or something that's touching here today. It's the, uh, this one is the 425, and it's kind of an interesting. Uh, concept because uh, scopes have changed quite a bit down through the uh, years. And that is, uh, this one had what was called a synchronous time base. That is, you put in a signal. In order to get the, sit, the trace to sit still, you had to adjust the internal time base to match the incoming signal. So now, uh, that gets a little touchy when you're using a pot to try to do that. Uh, modern day oscilloscopes have uh, what's called trigger circuits in them. And those trigger circuits is what is used to uh, make it uh, sit still. So uh, oscilloscope, a useful uh, tool in the ham shack. Probably can't read this inscription here, but it says, uh, no, Greg went to the ham auction this afternoon to get rid of a couple of old radios that were cluttering up the place. Oh, I think I hear him pulling in now. <laughs> <laughs> Your typical uh, ham uh, fest uh, scenario, huh? <laughs> so many uh, scopes are available today, ham fest, and also on eBay. The one that you're seeing here, I've had about a month now. Uh, this was an eBay purchase, and uh, this is a Philips oscilloscope that sold uh, something up in a couple of three thousand dollars initially, and I bought it off eBay for forty-five dollars. Uh, uh, the description of it was that uh, the power's up, you have a trace on it, but we can't test it from there. You see a lot of that stuff going on, and so when I got it, the uh, front end uh, attenuators in it were all noisy and didn't really work, so I took all the knobs off, pulled off this front panel, <laughs> took all the screws out, uh, about 12 connectors, about three water wires to unsolder, and took this panel out, uh, used some spray on the connector, on the uh, uh, pots, uh, pots and the uh, switches that are in there, cleans it up, stable as a rock, and uh, so I'll give you 80 50 bucks, bucks for it now. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How fast is it? What's your favorite spray? Uh, well, I used a, a Radio Shack one this time. Uh, uh, probably wasn't my, my favorite because it does have some lube uh, in it. And usually I like to try to clean them without lube on them, but uh, uh, I don't know it seems to be working okay, so uh, uh, it's the only spray that I had at the time. Uh, so uh, works great. So, what's an oscilloscope? It's an instrument. It's used to plot two things. On the vertical scale, it's plotting voltage. Uh, that is the amplitude of a signal versus the time uh, on the uh, horizontal axis. And uh, the units that are used then to measure the uh, vertical and the horizontal it would be the volts per division. And uh, on the horizontal, it would be the time per division. And we have some switches that we can switch in uh, and uh, make measurements by assigning different uh, factors to how much each division is. And uh, in this particular uh, uh, picture that you have here, there's eight divisions high, so this is in a uh, uh, certain uh, eight times whatever your volts per division would give you the amplitude. And then also in the time per division, it's usually in terms of uh, microseconds or milliseconds or seconds get into some of the higher frequency scopes up into the gigahertz uh, region, uh, you might be also measuring up into the picoseconds. So uh, those are some of the uh, typical types of measurements. Some of the players uh, would be uh, Agilent, uh, the uh, Philips, uh, 
Sculps, uh, Tektronics, and uh, the Fluke uh, types, and uh, so they come in uh, various configurations as far as the uh, size and the form are uh, concerned, uh, all the way from uh, some of the older heavy boat anchors up to the little handheld uh, Fluke uh, scope meter, which uh, the uh, Phillips and Fluke uh, are now kind of in joint venture selling each other's equipment in uh, uh, two different companies, uh, countries in uh, Europe and in uh, the U.S. So here's some categories of oscilloscopes. There's a lot of different types of oscilloscopes out there. And, uh, you probably already thought there was one. But uh, if we look at this, there's the analog CRO, or is capital gray oscilloscope. Those are uh, a lot of the uh, older ones that are kind of going by the wayside, but still used in a lot of uh, uh, radio, shack, uh, radio uh, ham shacks. Uh, analog storage scopes. Uh, analog storage scopes used a special uh, tube and the tube was coated with a phosphor that had a persistence of a few seconds, so you could display the uh, display on the tube and then remove the signal, and then it would remain there for a few seconds, so you might be able to take a photograph of it or to analyze it within that short time frame, and then it would fade away. Uh, also, the, uh, there's analog dual beam scope, uh, which uh, actually has a CRT in it that has two electron guns, and, uh, actually emits two electrons and uh, places that uh, uh, those signals on the screen. Uh, then there's the uh, digital storage scope with a CRT display. That's the kind that we have here. And uh, we'll be giving you a little demo of that. There's also digital storage scopes with uh, LCD displays, such as the uh, Fluke uh, scope meter. Uh, there's uh, digital sampling scopes, uh, which give you some higher bandwidths. And then there's also mixed signal scopes. Uh, these would be mixed signals between analog and digital. So we can actually display, say, two or four analog signals on, and at the same time display uh, the uh, on-off uh, pulses of uh, digital types of signals. So for uh, computer type work and digital type work, uh, uh, those are uh, kind of handy. Uh, we say 16 uh, digital, there's some that go up higher than that, 32, and uh, usually in those steps of 16. And uh, that will have like then 16 wires coming out of it, and you have to put those on various places in the circuit in order to check out the timing relationships uh, between all of those uh, different uh, signals. There's also the mixed domain, which combines the scope and the spectrum analyzer all in one uh, uh, box. Spectrum analyzer. What does a spectrum analyzer plot? Frequency. It will plot frequency versus amplitude uh, rather than time. And so you have uh, those two uh, combinations. And then perhaps the latest entry into the field is more the uh, PC based oscilloscopes. There's uh, two different types of uh, those. Uh, one is a sound card uh, type, which I have, uh, uh, can give you a little, little demo on that. And then there's also the hardware type, which uh, is actually uh, allows you to go up uh, much higher frequencies and uh, usually has a USB output, uh, output on it, so you just plug it in and run a software program along to uh, uh, get the uh, signals that way. So basically what I'm looking at here is these uh, three that are in red, and we'll talk a little bit about those and some of the uh, uh, principles are. Typical uh, front panel of a, an oscilloscope uh, is uh, divided into uh, four different sections. And here we have the uh, display controls, such as uh, controls your intensity, your focus, it may control uh, trace rotation. And then uh, there's the uh, vertical uh, input section, uh, which is the uh, input for your uh, signal input, and we have uh, input uh, channel 1 and channel 2, sometimes uh, more, more likely labeled channel A and channel B, but you see both of those depending upon what kind of scope it is. And then you have a uh, volts per division uh, here, which uh, usually goes in a 1, 2, 5 sequence in the uh, built-in attenu attenuator that's in there. Also, there's the horizontal section. Horizontal section is uh, what is being plotted along the uh, horizontal axis, and that would be your time in terms of uh, time per division. 
And then in order to get that trace to sit still and actually pick off different points on a signal or different points on a screen, you have what's called a triggering circuit. And that uh, triggering circuit then is what uh, stabilizes the signal so that you can make uh, comparative uh, time uh, measurements. Cathode ray tube in the uh, CRO is the kind of the heart of that. And uh, the uh, principle here is that we have a heating filament over on your left. Uh, then we have a cathode. That cathode is heated up and it starts emitting electrons. And the electrons then uh, will uh, go through a focusing system. Two sets of deflection plates. One is the vertical deflection, the other is the horizontal deflection. And then uh, depending upon uh, if, this, uh, if there's no voltage on the deflection plates, there's a beam that goes straight through and you get a bright dot uh, right at the uh, center. And that's uh, the uh, point that uh, you don't want to leave your intensity up for a long time on these because it'll burn the phosphor on there and uh, you'll have a, a permanent uh, spot on there. Uh, if you have uh, the intensity normally on a scope, you want to keep your intensity to the, the minimum value that you can still uh, get good information uh, off of the uh, scope itself. So in order to deflect this beam, then we need to put a voltage on the vertical. And uh, if we put, say, a signal into channel A, it takes the uh, input signal, uh, transforms it into a little higher voltage so that it can swing the beam vertically up and down. And the horizontal deflection then uh, is uh, controlled in the uh, scope itself to drag the beam back and forth across the uh, uh, front of the screen. So when this electron beam hits the phosphor, then it fluoresces and uh, you get your uh, uh, picture on the front. Also, there's a uh, high voltage anode out here and these run up into several thousand volts. So if you're looking into a scope or working on it, that's a point of caution. Yeah. Get up to 20, 30,000 volts at that point. So uh, you need to know where to do the probing or where to uh, put your fingers in, in that uh, point. So here's a typical uh, analog CRO circuit. And we have a, uh, a circuit here with uh, input on channel one. See if my pointer works here. Uh, goes into our attenuator. This is where we have uh, uh, coupling. We'll talk about that on the next slide here, which is uh, AC, DC, or ground. Uh, it's fed into a pre-amplifier section, get a little more gain. And then it's uh, capped off at that point to go into the trigger system so that some point on the signal we pick off to start the uh, trigger uh, system and uh, in the uh, trigger system then we can set the level, the slope, and the mode of our, uh, of our triggering. Also in this preamp uh, we can uh, control the position on the screen, the vertical position, uh, the uh, mode of operation, and the volts per division would all tie into that. Then from the preamp it's fed into a delay line and uh, then into an amp and then into the vertical deflection plates. What's the purpose of the delay line? Isn't it to uh, delay the signal uh, enough to allow the trigger circuit to kind of match up with it? Absolutely uh, correct. Uh, so if we triggered immediately, it would start dragging across here. Uh, but we want a certain point on here, so it just delays that vertical signal from getting to the vertical deflection plates uh, until we get uh, the horizontal section activated down here. Uh, what the trigger does then, it starts a sweep generator. So this is just a ramp generator. And uh, that ramp generator is what drags your beam from left to right uh, horizontally. And uh, that uh, signal then uh, is uh, the value of the sweep generator or the frequency of it is con controlled by your uh, uh, number of the divisions there, your time per division or seconds per division. Uh, that's fed into the amp which also controls your horizontal position and then uh, drags it back to it horizontally. CRT control has uh, some different functions as part of that display section, that force section which is the uh, uh, subscopes. You have a beam finder uh, you might have some signal coming in and you don't know where the beam is. You can hit it and it'll drag it back to the center so you know uh, where the beam is. Also, uh, the focus control and the intensity are uh, other uh, ones there, other controls.
So this is just showing through that vertical circuit, it would put a sine wave into <coughs> channel one that uh, we get that uh, little red mark going up and down. And uh, that's due to the voltage on the vertical deflection plates uh, uh, just going to the peak values of that uh, sine wave. So there's uh, three different types of vertical input coupling. Uh, one is uh, AC coupling. That inserts a blocking capacitor in series with the uh, input. And uh, so if you have some really small signal uh, on a DC level, it'll block that and you can amplify just the uh, uh, signal itself. An uh, example might be, or an application might be if you're looking at a power supply voltage. Uh, maybe you've got a 12 volt power supply, but you've only got 100 millivolts of ripple. You can uh, isolate and blow that 100 millivolts up to do an analysis on that. There's also the uh, DC coupling. Uh, that uh, removes the uh, blocking capacitor. And then you can actually measure DC levels. It's very useful in uh, uh, looking at uh, digital circuits where you're looking at uh, logic levels. Uh, the ground uh, let's switch on here uh, will uh, disconnect your external signal so it doesn't ground what's coming into the scope, but it grounds the input amplifier. And that way it allows you to set a zero uh, reference uh, on the display. So it doesn't ground the circuit that's uh, being measured. Kind of a picture of how the horizontal circuit works is that we have the uh, sine wave picked off here from the uh, vertical preamplifier fed into our trigger system. It uh, generates uh, either positive or uh, can generate positive or negative going uh, slopes to uh, trigger on uh, various points on the uh, incoming signal. And then it generates a, a linear ramp. And uh, this ramp needs to be linear, so we get a linear volts, uh, uh, not volts, but uh, time per division along the horizontal axis. So the time base operation, here we have the uh, trigger point, and say we've got our uh, scope set up for one millisecond per division on the uh, horizontal. It will then generate, and we have 10 divisions along here, which means then we need a ramp here of uh, going from zero up to whatever the voltage level uh, is for the maximum voltage here to pull the sweep across. And uh, so we would need a 10 millisecond ramp. <coughs> well, there's another feature on uh, many oscilloscopes. That's called uh, hold-off time. Anybody tell me what hold-off time is? Delay after you trigger, right? Eh? Delay after you're uh, uh, at the end of the ramp, actually. So it's not at the trigger okay, point, but it's at right. the end of the ramp. It's right... Uh, First of all, we've got a blanking pulse because we don't want to see the, the signal, the uh, trace coming back across from right to left. So we put in a blanking pulse, but then right after the blanking pulse, we put this hold off in there, which means we delay the next, uh, even if the trigger comes through, we're going to delay the time that the next ramp starts up again. The advantage of that and the use is that if we get some frequency incoming that's kind of a uh, offsetting with the uh, ramp is that you can, if it doesn't trigger real well, you can change that hold off on there and then uh, adjust that so you still get a stable uh, trigger on the, uh, on the scope itself. So there is a limitation on that, but you do have uh, some hold off available there. So we have this uh, 10 millisecond ramp. Uh, what's the period of this waveform? We count across here the number of divisions, and uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, and about eight, so we've got about 5.8. Multiply that times the one millisecond per division. So the uh, total time then should be uh, 5.8 uh, milliseconds. Now maybe we want to also make a, a frequency measurement off of this. What would the frequency of that be? How could you find it? Reciprocal. Well, it would be the reciprocal, one divided by uh, 5.8 milliseconds, and how many seconds is that? 
because you need to be in seconds if you're going to get the frequency in hertz. 5.8 milliseconds is how many seconds? Point zero zero five eight. You just move the decimal place over uh, uh, three places. So if we divide one by point zero zero five eight, it shows that we get 172.4 uh, hertz. So that is that would be the frequency. So we got application both for measuring uh, time and uh, frequency. Just a picture here of a uh, electron gun. There's not a lot of these around. Uh, Phillips had one scope, the PM3233 and 32, that had uh, the uh, dual beam in it. Uh, advantage of dual beam is that on very, very low frequencies, if you wanted to compare uh, signals, that uh, you could compare the two signals by the two beams. That was uh, uh, for uh, very low frequency types of measurements, maybe in the mechanical area, one hertz or 0 0.01 or 100 millihertz or that type of frequency, they uh, worked uh, very well. There's also dual trace oscilloscopes, uh, and there's also four trace scopes, and these can be used basically for two reasons, for two purposes. One is to compare amplitudes, and the other would be to uh, compare a timing relationships. So you can have channel A, channel B on the screen at the same time. Or with a four channel, you could have all four channels on at the same time looking at the timing relationships. <coughs> Dual trace scopes also uh, had uh, have uh, three different modes of operation. Uh, you can uh, use them in what's called the alternate mode. In the alternate mode, it means it's alternating between channel A and channel B. So first of all, it looks at channel A signal with a the ramp. Then it goes back and it looks at channel B. So at higher frequencies, these occur so fast, it uh, just looks like one trace on the screen. However, if you go to very low frequencies, you'll see one move across the screen, then it'll go to the other one and move across. So to look at lower frequencies, then the, you have the chopped mode. And the chopped mode looks uh, uh, with a timing signal between A and B and just alternates back and forth very quickly uh, with the uh, single ramp. And so uh, you're able to, and that's usually in somewhere in the uh, kilohertz region as far as the uh, switching, I think 10, 20 kilohertz maybe, as far as the uh, frequency is concerned. And then another feature is that you can also add A and B algebraically. So if you've got two signals, you're trying to balance them, put one in the inverse, uh, which is another input of the or function of the channel A and B uh, vertical. And uh, you can uh, null one against the other, for instance, and uh, compare a standard, for instance, to uh, something you're, you're trying to measure. Here's a uh, picture of kind of the, the block diagram, a little difficult to read there, but what you have is uh, your input from channel A, input from channel B. There's a little switch shown as a switch here, and uh, that switch uh, then uh, uh, is either in the alternate, alternate mode, it's not a switch you turn, but uh, it's an electronic switch that would jump back and forth and uh, switch the beam between the two. Again, you have a delay line, the vertical output. Uh, you also have a little chopper oscillator in here, uh, the uh, unblanking uh, pulse, and uh, uh, you can pull the uh, triggering uh, off of uh, either channel A or uh, channel B here. The uh, digital storage scope, the uh, little, little block diagram here is that we have uh, the uh, front end amplifier, <coughs> which uh, we put in our signal. First of all, it goes to a, a digitizer. Uh, this would be a circuit, like an analog to digital converter, which then converts uh, our analog to digital information. Uh, this is uh, running at some particular clock frequency. And so the uh, frequency of that clock and the amount of digits we're digitizing will uh, determine what our uh, display is going to look like and also what our, <coughs> our bandwidth of the scope is. Put uh, that digitizer into also a digital storage. We can put it into some memory then since we've got it in digital information. Uh, or we can uh, read it out, uh, that digital information with a D to A converter, digital to analog, and uh, then uh, feed that into a uh, conventional type of CRO, capital gray tube out here with that uh, system. It also enable, it enables you to do uh, some uh, uh, types of uh, automated measurement with oscilloscopes by putting in what's called this GPIB.
general purpose interface bus, and uh, the bus that's quite often used is the IEEE 488 to plug on the back so you can tie it into a computer and control the whole uh, computer uh, with a, uh, 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 control the whole scope of the computer uh, program. <coughs> also, if you want uh, uh, analog uh, information recorded, you can feed the, the analog output to a strip chart recorder. So once you have the information stored or signal stored, then uh, you can remove the input and uh, it will continue to uh, show up on the cathode ray tube. So this is a better storage device than the old uh, high persistence uh, types of CRTs where it was displayed on the, uh, the screen itself. So the uh, box that I've got along here is the uh, Philips PM3305 and uh, uh, this can be used basically in uh, either either mode, either a CRO or in the uh, uh, digital storage mode. And so uh, looking at the uh, front panel here, we have our display controls over here on the uh, left, intensity, focus, there's a trace rotation, illumination. There's also a built-in calibrator, puts out a, a signal of uh, 1.2 volts uh, peak uh, on the uh, square wave for uh, uh, checking uh, probes and also for uh, checking kind of cross-checking and calibration. Over on the uh, vertical side here, we have our switches. We can switch from A to alternate to chop to add to B modes. Uh, there's a, a switch uh, or a knob here to pull to invert uh, the B channel. And we have our coupling down here, AC, DC, or ground, like we talked about. And uh, we also have uh, the volts per division in the one, two, five sequence. Also, a variable control here for uh, if you want something other than the uh, step functions that are on the amplitude uh, per division. On the uh, horizontal uh, side, then we have the uh, different functions up here with the auto triggering, which means that the signal is always going to be there, and that's kind of the one you kind of start out with if you uh, uh, want to uh, see a trace on the screen. Uh, if you put it in the AC mode, you have to have some kind of a signal uh, coming into the uh, channel uh, in order to uh, trigger on the signal itself. So AC triggers on the signal itself, put it in the DC mode, that actually triggers at a point on the screen so that you can either do screen triggering or you can do uh, signal uh, triggering uh, on it. And uh, we have the uh, other uh, functions here, other triggering, uh, one that not all scopes have, but this one does. That's the TV, so if you have a composite video signal, it will uh, transform that into a good pulse signal and lock in uh, as a nice feature if you're doing a video <coughs> type of work. Then also you've got one for the slope, that's for uh, plus or minus, uh, if you want to trigger on the uh, positive side of the uh, signal or the negative. Uh, there's also an X magnifier built in here and then down here we have the uh, trigger source, so we can trigger off channel A, channel B, or we can put in an external signal over here and trigger off uh, either external or external uh, divide by 10. So those uh, functions are just kind of like a conventional oscilloscope. The uh, other section on here we'll take a look at in just a minute. That's the uh, uh, digital uh, storage uh, function that's on this scope as well. So I uh, just have a little... Uh, little oscillator here, this little uh, Philips uh, low frequency uh, oscillator, and uh, we can see if I can uh, trigger it here on uh, channel 8, and we've got it in auto mode right now. If I uh, push the uh, zero coupling down here, this gives me the straight line, then I can use the position reference to reference that at any point on the screen. I'll set it at center, release the zero. Over here is the time for division. So we have the uh, number of, uh, uh, count the number of cycles, and we can, so from this we can determine the time from the time base over here, and also the uh, amplitude from the uh, volts per division. Also, you can have AC and DC coupling. Uh, you notice the probably you don't see it too well there, but there's just a little bit of a jump, which means there's just a little bit of DC offset coming out of this, uh, this box. Uh, over on the uh, triggering here then, we have uh, the 
uh, level control. So as I move that up and down, you can see it's uh, moving up and down on the uh, trace itself. If I put it in the AC mode, now I can trigger on the trace itself, but I can go outside of that, then the triggering quits if we're not in the auto mode. Also in the DC mode, it should look about the same uh, on uh, that uh, triggering as well. And as far as the slope is concerned, right now it's triggering on the plus slope as it's going up. Push that, now it's triggering on the negative slope going down. So uh, this enables you then, if you're looking at pulses, for instance, to measure pulse width uh, or the uh, frequency of pulse train, for instance, by changing those uh, trigger uh, positions. Oscilloscope probes, also one of the things that you want to uh, make sure is that your probe is uh, set up uh, correctly, and this is a point that a lot of people uh, miss, is that uh, you have what's called the probe compensation. And uh, on the probe itself, um, most of the, the better probes have a a little screwdriver adjustment right on the box itself here. So if you uh, put that on the uh, on the scope, I'll just feed this into channel A here. And then I'll uh, clip it up here on our calibrator, which is putting out 1.2 volts. And we'll position that here, you'll notice there's a, a little bit of, of rounding. So how you want to adjust that is so that you get a nice uh, square wave uh, on there. Should have a screwdriver right here to see if we can tweak that up a bit. And you can see the, the difference here. Compensation. So if your probe is misadjusted and you've got, say, a 35 megahertz scope, you've no longer got 35 megahertz scope. Uh, the uh, probe itself is uh, cutting off the, the bandwidth there. If you, let's go and see if we can go to the high side here. a little internal adjustment. But what you would get uh, would be this type of a pattern here, which is overcompensation, so you should be able to go from the lower to the higher here, but you want to try to square it off the uh, best you can uh, on that. And inside of the scope itself, you've got about a one megahertz uh, input impedance with a 20, about a 20 picofarad uh, the oscilloscope input uh, uh, used with the 10x probe puts a 9 meg probe there, so you've got one tenth of the signal across the uh, uh, scope itself. So for the uh, digital uh, storage, you've got a number of different controls here, and uh, just show you those on the uh, scope here. If we have this input signal, we turn memory on, and then uh, lock it in, then I can remove this signal and my storage is, is still there so the signal is still locked in here and uh, so it doesn't matter now what I do with the controls here, it's just that if you're trying to make some measurements don't move these until you've looked at how many volts per division or what the time, uh, time frame is there in order to uh, come up with the uh, uh, appropriate uh, analysis of the uh, signal. Also, it uh, allows you to walk through. Uh, there's uh, some uh, little LEDs on here, and you can walk through the whole pulse train. And it gives you, uh, in quarters here, the different places. So you can actually expand, uh, expand those up. And I'll uh, unlock it here when the signal goes away. 
the uh, last uh, uh, type of scope that I wanted to mention here was the uh, uh, PC type. And uh, there's a number of different uh, types out there. There's two basic types. One is the uh, sound card oscilloscope, which takes direct input <coughs> to your computer and then uh, looks and analyzes uh, that signal. And also there's the uh, uh, PC peripheral uh, scope, which uh, uses external hardware. And with the external hardware, it's a little box that you uh, purchase and uh, feed your probes into it, plug the USB into your uh, uh, computer. So I'm gonna just show you a couple of different types. Uh, this is a free download. I've got the web address there that you can download and play with. It's uh, actually several different instruments, uh, which I'll give you a little a little demo on here. There's a, these are some of the specifications uh, for this particular uh, unit uh, or the software. Is that remember it's a sound card, so you're working with just audio frequencies. Can't feed any RF into here. You better not. You might damage your uh, damage your computer but there are uh, trigger modes for uh, off automatic normal uh, there's uh, trigger levels that can be set with the mouse uh, there's uh, two channels these can be added subtracted multiplied there's XY mode uh, a lot of uh, functionality uh, with this and uh, the uh, it also includes a signal generator and a uh, uh, XY uh, function as well see if it'll fire up here for me. And I'm just going to use the uh, internal uh, signal generator to generate some signals that you can uh, put it in a mode where it's a loopback type of uh, condition. And so this little, uh, here we have our, this is a single channel, so we have our amplitude per division. Uh, here we have our time uh, per division. Trigger circuits down here for rising leading edges auto-triggering. And I'm going to pull out the uh, signal generator here into a separate box. And then we'll go back to oscilloscope on this one. Here we can turn, uh, say, channel one on. We've got a dual channel uh, uh, generator and just a single channel scope here. Uh, now we've got a uh, signal, a little bit hard to see up there. But, uh, you can then play with this, change the uh, time per division, for instance, uh, also the uh, amplitude per division. And if we go over here and put the uh, second channel into operation, we uh, now have a second uh, signal but it's overlaid right on the other one since we've got the settings the same, so I'm gonna bring this down amplitude-wise. And so now we have a way of uh, comparing, and you can't really see it up here. I don't know if, uh, can we get another light down there? Yeah. Light over there. Oh. oh yeah. Oh yeah, there's some red. So there's a, a green trace, and then there's also the red trace, which is your uh, channel B, shows that it's being triggered, and uh, I can uh, change that triggering point by uh, grabbing a hold of that uh, yellow trace there, if I can find it. So here I can set my trigger level and also uh, another thing that you might have done with oscilloscopes before if we uh, set the uh, frequency up here you can type in whatever frequency you want now I've got 440 on one generator uh, 880 on the other one and then I'm going to go to the uh, XY graph what's that pattern called? Lissajou pattern and it, uh, this one with the figure eight then shows that there's two points on the top, one on the side, so you've got a two to one ratio, 440 to 880, uh, between the two uh, signals there. I'm 
going to get some light here, I guess. So that's uh, one of them you can download. There's another one that's uh, called Visual Analyzer. This is also a free download. This is a much more complex one, and I, there's a lot of uh, information out there on it, a lot of uh, But on this one, it uh, gives you a frequency uh, or a scope on the top, and then it gives you a spectrum analyzer uh, on the bottom. And uh, I think we had the other one in here first. Uh, yeah, let me pull this one up just to take a look at it. This is the Zell, Zell scope. This is another one you can download on and it's a much more simpler one. It's just strictly a, uh, an oscilloscope. And uh, you can start the signal. And right now it's just picking up noise from my microphone here. And if I wanted to uh, lock it in, I can stop it. Now I can analyze what, what the audio signal is. Should also be able to feed it in. I have not been real successful in getting a steady state signal or something with the sampling and I think it's got to do with my scope. These were designed basically on XP but running on Windows 7 it seems to be a little bit more uh, unstable there. So Zell scope is another one. Uh, you have the same types of controls. Uh, this is the uh, visual analyzer one. It's a dual channel. And these are some of the controls that are there. Uh, some of the other uh, tools that are in here. It also gives you a voltmeter, a frequency meter, wave generator, phase. It'll measure uh, total harmonic distortion. And you can also use it as a ZRLC meter. So there's a lot of functionality. So here's the warning to you. If you're going to play around with these, uh, be careful about putting signals into your computer. Just because it says it's an oscilloscope, don't, don't plug in your uh, sound card into the 120 volts and expect to see the uh, signal. I've heard of cases of that being done, so this is a, giving you a fair warning here. And this is a, a protection circuit that uh, just uses a couple of back-to-back uh, -back diodes here to uh, clamp down uh, the incoming signal to your sound card to about uh, 1.2 volts and uh, the uh, forward volt drop of uh, two diodes on there. And uh, what I did to uh, facilitate that is I built a little probe adapter here. So I've got to uh, come in here with channel A, channel B, put my two probes on here, and then uh, plug this into the sound card, uh, into the uh, microphone jack, actually. And uh, also, uh, a lot of microphone jacks don't have stereo input, so you have to know whether that, that you can use both channels or not. Uh, most sound cards uh, that go into a computer have dual channels, so then you could use both uh, channel A and channel B on the, on the little box here. And it's just uh, basically, uh, I didn't put the pots in here, I just put a 5K resistor. So basically it's taken, uh, if I put in three volts here, I'm gonna get one volt here. That's gonna clamp it so it doesn't, go, make sure it doesn't go over the 1.2 volts and damage your uh, sound card. So you need those uh, protection diodes in there. The visual analyzer, uh, I'll just bring that up here so you can take a look at it. So here we have uh, all of the uh, uh, different uh, functions. Uh, here we need to uh, turn it on. And then uh, it'll start picking up uh, the audio here from my voice. Yeah. And if we uh, wanted to capture that, there's a capture scope mode here. capturing it. Now if we wanted to uh, look at a particular section on here, it's just a matter of highlighting that section and it blows up that little section and, or uh, doing the analysis on it. You can do the same thing with the 
with the spectrum analyzer that's on here. Also, the uh, other features that are on here include the uh, voltmeter, which uh, I'm not sure that we're putting out a thousand volts there, but uh, <laughs> it's reading something. And then we have the uh, frequency meter here. And then there's also a phase meter that uh, can be used. There's the uh, view of the uh, total harmonic distortion as well. And uh, there, there's a newer version out that here's a new ZLR, uh, LCR meter, which uh, you can use to measure capacitance, inductance, impedance, real and imaginary phase, and all of those kinds of things. So it's kind of a learning curve on this one, and I'm not there yet either, so we're uh, still, uh, still working on that one. The PC hardware type uh, comes in kind of these configurations. This is one called a PicoScope. It sells for about $206. And it uh, does have a bandwidth that goes up to 200 megahertz. So now you've got a little more power and you can, uh, without having the, the full oscilloscope here, you can uh, show the display on your uh, scope. So another one that's a little bit cheaper I ran across, which is the Hamtech Model 2090. This one's about $150 to $180. Uh, 100 megahertz bandwidth. And uh, the, uh, it can, it's, uh, can be used on, with the uh, USB port on your uh, computer. Uh, so some of the applications that uh, just wanted to run through here and uh, talk about just a little bit uh, is uh, time and frequency measurements, listen to patterns we've talked about. Also for measuring pulse characteristics, pulse widths, uh, looking at uh, rise times of pulses, amplitude of pulses. This is kind of a definition here of all, all of the different uh, items that uh, you would associate with the uh, pulse characteristics. Uh, here's a good formula to remember if you have an oscilloscope and you want to relate that as far as, far as the rise time is concerned. The rise time you're going to measure, it has, your scope has to be better than what that rise time of that uh, signal is you're putting into that. So. Uh, there's a formula that says 0.35 divided by the 3 dB falloff point uh, on the uh, scope itself. So when you have a 35 megahertz scope, they're usually saying it's at 35 megahertz uh, falling off about 3 dB at that point. So that, uh, if you divided 0.35 by, uh, by a 35 megahertz scope, it'd be what, point, uh, 0 0.01, about uh, 10 uh, 10 milliseconds then would be kind of the rise time there. And the rise time is defined as measuring it from the 10% uh, up to the 90% uh, point on the scope. This is one point that when having a scope calibrated that uh, that will be uh, looked at. Another application is just in good old troubleshooting circuits and uh, looking at uh, for uh, bad components. Digital signal tracing is another application where if you're looking at uh, different types of gates uh, what kind of gate have we got up here? And that's an AND gate that says we've got to have a one and a one on the input to get a one on the output. So we can, uh, if we have pulses coming into uh, the uh, front end of that, the, the only time that we're going to get uh, an output or a one on the output is when both of those are at a one. So we just examine the two circuits here. This is one, one, this is the one out. One, one, this is one out. And uh, at any other point, we get basically zero output. So with a uh, two-channel scope, we can uh, look at uh, uh, those uh, timing relationships. Also, this is another handy tool. Anybody here build up an octopus tester? Yeah, it's a component tester. It's a quick and dirty way of checking on diodes and uh, some capacitors. And uh, basically, you, you take a, a, a down step, step down transformer put in a little voltage divider, and then you uh, feed the vertical side off to the uh, uh, side that's measuring the current through that 1K resistor, and these are some of the patterns then that you can uh, get uh, with that. I uh, built one up here out of a little, little box. I had some uh, capacitance standards when I was doing calibration work, and I just pulled one off and found uh, this is a good place if you've got some of those little blocks that are volts AC output, what do you do with them? Uh, it's a good application if you've got six volts. This is a nine volt AC output uh, on it and uh, just plugged uh, into the uh, power here. And uh, let me feed this one in here. Give it 
give you a demo on the on the diode here. Take my memory back off there. So you could so what it's looking at basically is is a phase angle, and. Uh, So now we're looking at basically the uh, forward, uh, uh, the, the breakdown in the forward uh, direction here. So if I re reverse the, the diode on here, just put a little uh, clip on here. Now we just get the opposite, uh, opposite uh, direction on this one. So you can tell whether the, the diode is basically good or bad, whether it's shorted. If it's uh, shorted, uh, then uh, current with no voltage across it. So that's another uh, application. Uh, amplitude modulation, talking about AM. Yeah. There you go. Uh, I built up a little two inch uh, modulation monitor back in the 50s mm -hmm. uh, that uh, gave a trapezoidal pattern rather than this pattern. And then you look at the peak here versus the peak here, and uh, you can monitor what the uh, AM uh, values are. Uh, easy way to do that. Analyzing complex TV waveforms. Uh, we can look at uh, those with the TV triggering. There's another little uh, application. I haven't uh, built this, but uh, it's one of the, called an RF sampler that was built in an oil Altoid box by a K6LS, and just found this one on his uh, website. Uh, this presentation also will be up on the internet, so you'll have these schematics and if you're interested in them. But uh, make sure you uh, have all your antennas connected and uh, <laughs> make sure that measurements are uh, working uh, properly and, uh, so we don't have this happening. We had one ex example of that I guess <laughs> this morning already. So there's some uh, free scope tutorials on uh, a place I ran across, uh, hobbyprojects.com. YouTube has a lot of them as well. There's uh, search for uh, scope uh, tutorials. Uh, Tektronics has some great information on their uh, website as well. So uh, those are some of the uh, uh, places that uh, you, you might look. So that kind of wraps it up in a nutshell. And uh, uh, I also have uh, my website up there, www.jg-technology.com. If any of you are into measurements, I've got three free videos on there. Uh, some webinars that I did for a company in Bloomington, uh, uh, which uh, two of them are on measurement uncertainty, which is how do you know that what you're measuring here uh, is uh, actually true or not? And uh, then there's another one on uh, introduction to measurements and calibration. So pop in there, put your uh, email address in, you're in and looking at those. So those are available for your, for your viewing as well. So I guess that's it. Any questions? external uh, horizontal uh, input. Okay. Or on some scopes, they use the channel B with a switch position, and uh, you go through the channel B uh, with an external signal too. So you need that external XY function. I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you have 